Hello, everybody, and welcome to Where Are They Now? This is brought to you by Malibu Clothes. Get your suits right here at the Malibu Clothes Building in Beverly Hills. Today's guest is a former Major League Baseball player and manager. He played in the league for 19 years for the Cincinnati Reds and the KC Royals. And then after that, he managed the Royals for four years, and he also managed two years with the Tampa Bay Devil Rays at the time. They were called the Devil Rays. And he did much more. Please welcome Hal McRae. Welcome. Thank you. What's happening? Hanging out. Playing a little golf. I try to work out, <laughs> stay in shape. Spend a lot of time with the grandkids, but other than that, enjoy my retirement. You got drafted by the Cincinnati Reds. What's it like coming on the diamond when you made your first, you know, when you got called up? You got Pete Rose, Tony Perez, Johnny Bench, Concepcion, like in the development of the Big Red Machine. What was it like? Well, it was fun uh, playing with those guys. You know, I, I was a platoon, platoon player, so I didn't play every day. But the camaraderie was great. The interaction between those guys was great. Sparky kind of kept things in order by getting things done uh, through the players. Who took you under your wing with the Cincinnati Reds? I know you only played with them for four years, but who would you really learn a lot from as a, as a ball player? Well, I try to pattern my play after Pete Rose. You know, I, I was a, that type player. And watching him, you know, slide head first, uh, play hard, run hard, wasn't afraid of contact. So I would say he influenced my style more so than any of the other players on the club. When you got traded to the Kansas City Royals, who was your batting instructor at the time? Uh, Charlie Lau was my batting instructor. Major influence on me. Uh, great man. Great teacher. Was a great friend. What did Charlie teach you? What did you learn from him as a hitter? You know, nowadays they talk about hitting the inside of the baseball. What did he teach you back then? Well, we didn't talk inside and outside during those days. What he taught us was, first of all, to be able to relax at home play. And we didn't understand it at the time, but, you know, when you relax, you're able to concentrate. And when you were able to concentrate, generally you, you, you're you uh, pretty confident. The major thing we learned was the ability to hit the ball to the opposite field. Is it true, if it's an outside pitch, do you step towards first base to hit that pitch, or you just let the ball get a little deeper? No, you turn your lower half and let the ball get a little deeper. By turning your lower half, uh, the ball travels, and you hit on get you get on top of the ball to make sure that you don't slice the ball, right. and 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 it keeps your head on the ball, but you don't step to toward the, uh, first base to hit the outside pitch as a right-handed hitter. When did you realize, how that you know that you could hit in the big leagues? Mm, probably my second or third year in Kansas City. When I learned where the hits were, the hits are on the other side of second base for a right-handed hitter. So when you learn where the hits were, I knew how to get a base hit. So if I was struggling... I wouldn't go more than two or three days without getting a base hit because I knew where the hits were. So I would go to home play just to get a hit. So I would get on top of the ball, hit a sharp line drive to the right side, and if I did that often enough, I was going to get a base hit. I experienced that too. I played college baseball. I was a 400 hitter, and I was a left-handed hitter. So I know exactly what you're talking about as far as letting the ball get to you, think away and then react in. That was my hitting approach, but I ain't playing Major League Baseball. I'm just saying, you know. It, it's the same if, if, everywhere, you know, right. you, because if you want to stay on the ball, if you want to give yourself a chance, mm -hmm. and Charlie would, would preach, give yourself a chance. You're not up 
You're not at home play to get a hit. You're at home play to give yourself a chance to get a hit. So if you let the ball get deep, you're giving yourself the best chance to get a base hit. Now, Charlie Lau also uh, taught that the extension let go of one hand at the end. Did you did you do that too? I did that too, yeah. And that allows you to stay through the ball and not come off the ball. And there was a misconception when we actually did that in a ball game. It wasn't intentional. We would practice that, but he never taught us to do that in the game itself. So it was just a teaching mechanism to get you to keep your head down, stay quiet, get on top of the ball, stay through the ball. When it happens in a ball game, it was a natural reaction. It was a positive reaction, but a natural reaction. How often did uh, George Brett and you, did you guys work together a lot? Because I know Charlie Lau took him in. He took you in. Did you guys come to the park early every day and work on with, with Charlie? Uh, we came when we needed to. Mm. Uh, but he was there for you. But we came when we needed to. I wouldn't say we, we came every day. And I think Brett probably came more than I did because he struggled when he first came to the big leagues. Did you? Did he teach you also to sit on pitches, or just to react? No, we 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 did both. Uh huh. You would look for pitches, and 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 sometimes when you would react, would react. If I saw the ball extremely well, I would react mm -hmm. because I knew I could hit with two strikes. And when I was at two strikes, I was sitting soft. Okay, but I would guess from pitch to pitch. And and I would guess predicated on what happened the pitch before or the bat before. What I wanted to do is get a base hit to the opposite field, first of all. And I would dictate to the pitcher where he was going to go with his next pitch of my next hit back. So the advantage was to get a base hit first, but always get it to the opposite field. And I saw to dictate what he was going to do. If I got a hit on a, a fastball, chances are the first or second pitch was going to be a breaking ball and vice versa. If I got a, a base hit on something away, chances are the first or second pitch was going to be in. So stay ahead of the pitcher, but you need to get base hits. And I wanted to get that hit to the opposite field to stay ahead of the pitcher. Now, how some pitchers, you know, some days it's just it's not happening with their breaking ball and off speed. So you would just look for the fastball then, right? If uh, the breaking ball wasn't there, if he wasn't, uh, play, you know, spotting it? Well, a good hitter, why it's so important for the hitter to stay on the bench. You know, guys run up and upside, uh, uh, run up, uh, inside to look at video and this and that. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is for you to stay on the bench, watch the pitcher. And you want to watch the pitcher because you're trying to, we, always, we, we already know the basic pitches that he has, okay? We're trying to eliminate something. What can I eliminate? What can I take away from this guy? What can I take away from him? How can I make it simpler for me to hit? So if he can't locate something, if he can't get something over, I can eliminate something. If he can't get a ball inside, I can eliminate inside. Right. If he can't get the ball away, I can eliminate away. If he can't get his breaking ball over, I eliminate his breaking ball. What I'm trying to deduce him down to one pitch, the fastball, which is the pitch I want to hit. Right. So I'm always watching to see – what can I take away from this guy? How can I break him down? Break him down is what I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to break him down in any way possible. And part of the breakdown is to get that first hit to the opposite field. That's part of the breakdown. And from there, I'm going to continuously try to break him down. But I got to stay on the bench, watch him, see what his tendencies are, see what he can do, see what he can't do. 90% of the pitches, even in college baseball and the big leagues, is outside. It's mostly outside. And if you try to pull that ball at me as a left-handed hitter, I'm playing pepper with the second baseman. Yeah, yeah, you're right. 90% of all pitches thrown to you are going to be away. 
because the breaking ball is going to be away. The fastball, the curveball, the slider, mm -hmm. basically the intent of those, those pitches is to be away, even the changer. So everything is geared to be away from you. So if you can't take care of that part of the plate, it, it's going to be very difficult for you to hit. I see a lot of big league hitters now, Some a lot of them give up their bats. Uh, the average major league hitter probably, and they won't admit it, mm -hmm. give away between 75 and 150 bats a year. 1976, Chambliss hits, hits a, a fly ball deep to right center. You're playing right field. Were you close to, uh, did you think if you had, a, I know you love golf, if there was a mulligan, if you could do it again, would you think you had a shot catching that ball or was it just too far away? No, I, I, I did, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a shot to catch it. What happened in that series, Otis got hurt, he had a sprained ankle. Mm -hmm. So Cowan's the natural right fielder, played center field. My position in the series was DH. So I went to right field, and and Cowens went to center field. Mm -hmm. Had Otis not gotten hurt, Cowens would have been in right field, Otis in center field. I was the DH. Al probably would have caught the ball. Wow. But there was no way that I would have caught it. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's part of the game. But, you know, that could have made the difference in the ball game because we had, you know, I was 5'10", and Al was like 6'3". Right, with right. better legs than I had, so he, he he probably would have caught that ball. All the fans are rushing on the field. How did you get out of that mess? I don't know. I was afraid, mainly for my glove, you know, because there were so many fans on the field. So my main concern was just get off the field. Mm -hmm. And I looked to my right, and volume service had a, a opening to the right of uh, uh, left field stands. Mm -hmm. So I looked in that direction. I looked all over, but I looked in that direction. I saw a door over there. So I ran toward the left field corner, and I was able to get out. Everybody came came in uh, the clubhouse safe? Everybody was good? Everybody, everybody got in. Everybody okay. got in. But everybody were a little afraid, and... Yeah. And I was, not for my life, but my glove. I thought maybe somebody snatched my glove off, off my hand while I was trying to get in. Tell me about you being a character with Steve Balboni. Your son told me this. What do you do with him when he strikes out for his hundredth time? Well, I gave him a bottle of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> I love <laughs> to <the> celebrate. <laughs> uh, uh, strike it out a hundred times. Let's say if he had 98 strikeouts, would you still buy the champagne earlier because you knew he's going to strike out twice? Oh, yeah, game? he was going to strike out. Once he got on a roll, he was going to strike out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And that was not the question. <laughs> he's going to strike out. <laughs> so, uh, what about the. Tell me the story about Jack McKeon. Your son told me this because I said, hey, give me some stories about your dad. Uh, he told me that after one game, uh, McKean pinch hit for you, and then what'd you do after the game on the road trip? Oh, it was a game down in Texas, I think, uh -huh. and I was struggling. So Jack made the right decision to pinch hit for me, but you know my pride was hurt. So once I came, well, I pretended I didn't hear when he was calling me, and the umpire told told me, uh, you know, the manager's calling you back to the dug dugout. He's going to pinch hit for you. So I was really pissed. Uh, so when I got to the dugout, I walked to the other end where I would sit majority of the time. Mm -hmm. And I started to take my uniform off to give it to Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I want to tell you about your World Series stats, did you realize your first 40 at-bats – you hit 450 out of your World Series career? Not really. No. Oh, well, I think Big Poppy just tied you because, you know, he had an awesome World Series just now. But how do you do it? How you got forty to 50,000 fans screaming. You were a clutch hitter. How do you manage to concentrate? Well, you're trained to concentrate. And, and, and you're conditioned to play in 
in front of a large crowd. Mm -hmm. What I try to do is focus on the pitch, focus on the ball. I wanted to make sure that I saw the ball. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't early on the ball. Mm-hmm. And and my my focus was basically on making sure that I see the pitch, recognize the pitch, and not be early. I never wanted to be early in, 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 a, in a, a clutch situation because when you're early, chances are you're going to make a mistake and you're not going to get the job done. It's fun of a clutch situation is to experience the feeling. Right. You know, sometimes you're, you're not you're not going to be rewarded. In most cases, you're going to fail 80%, 70% of the time. But it feels good. It's gratifying to when you come through, when you determine the, out, the outcome of the ball game, And that's what every player should strive to do, to be a difference maker, to determine the outcome of the ball game and when you get a chance to take advantage of that opportunity. Do you think some ball players today and in the past, do you think some of them are afraid to fail when it comes to the big stage, when it comes to that clutch hit they're looking for? Sure. Yeah? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So they're doubting that's, themselves. That's just part of it. You're not going to have nine guys that want to be up there. Right. You're only going to have two or three that that want to be there. And, and, and if, if a club has two or three guys that want to be at on plate in that clutch situ, at that clutch at crunch time, you know, you're a pretty good ball club. But everybody's not going to want to be there. There are going to be times when some guys want to be there. Sometimes they don't want to be there. Mm-hmm. Very few guys want to be there all of the time. And you want to be one of those players that wants to be there all the time. When you became a manager, give me the schedule. What time did you come to the park? You generally get the ballpark. Seven o'clock game. One o'clock and two o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, and then when the series starts, before the series starts, do you get the scouting report from the advanced scout? What's going on? With the well, opponents? You, you get, all your meetings are really conducted. Your big, your big meetings are conducted the first day. Mm-hmm. And then you have like the men in meetings uh, after that. But the, the, the first day, generally, you're going to get there sooner than you are the other days because you're going to have your big meeting and you get your scouting reports and all that. You go through all that the first day. Then the men in meet, meetings generally take place. The manager might not be involved, may be involved. In the, the the following days, so you 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 you, if I got that two o'clock the first day, I would get that one o'clock. Mm-hmm. So you get that one but o'clock. But your meetings done before the players get in in, in the clubhouse. Mm. And then, is it like when you get the report? Do you have a meeting with the ball players, or you just when the guys the opponents are hitting, you be like, hey, play this guy this way. You just no 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 you ha- you you you. you you meet with the coaches first, and then you meet with the players. And this is before a series starts? Yeah, everybody's on the same page. Jim. Okay. As a manager, <clears throat> when you would uh, set up, uh, give a sign to the third base coach, you know, for the hit and run and all that, is that all gut instinct on you? Like, okay, I'm going to go with a hit and run. This is a perfect count. A, a lot of times it's, 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 it's gut instinct. 2006, even though you had managing experience, did you learn anything from Tony La Russa? Yeah, you learn, you learn a lot from him because he's one of the probably better managers mm-hmm. that ever managed the game. And I think he's up for Hall of Fame or something. Uh, he's on a ballot. And I'm sure he's going to go in first, 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 first ballot. Well, let's say right now an organization calls you up and says, How? We want you to manage. You going to do it? No. That's it. You're done with baseball. No, no, I wouldn't say done, but but I wouldn't I wouldn't care to manage them. Mm. And not even a, as a coach, batting instructor. Well, there's some possibilities of that, but you know I'm I'm happy doing what I'm doing, which is you know what we alluded to earlier. So you know I'm not looking for work. Right, right. That's yeah. for sure. No, yeah. I hear you. So yeah. so when Hal McRae wakes up in the morning. 
he's focusing on golf now and talking to his grandkids. That's the bottom line. That's that's the bottom line. What's your handicap in golf? I'm about an 18, which is not great. Oh, okay. So you're you're working on it, right? I'm working on it, but I I can enjoy the game. Right, right. So I'm playing well enough to enjoy it. I'm, I, I, I like to get it down to 10 or 12, but I don't know if that's possible. I'm 68 years old now, and it's sort of late in the day to learn how to do something different. Mm. But I enjoy it now, and I play four or five times a week, and, and it's a lot of fun. Pal, it's, thank you so much. I really appreciate for doing this, uh, getting on. See, I'm simple, right? Simple, easy, right, there right, you right. go, all right? But <laughs> thank my wife and my son, because if I had to, you had to connect with, with me, on this cat thing, it would have never happened. <laughs> you know.